Hey folks, in today's video, I'm going to be ranking the stocks that you've suggested and I'll rate them based on uh, from strong buy to sell. Thanks to everyone in the community for your submissions, not only because this video wouldn't be possible without your help, but I also wouldn't be able to learn about these new investments that I wasn't aware of before. Investing in stocks is a lot like making friends. It's all about having some company. You can check out my YouTube channel's community tab to participate in polls and other activities like this. Speaking of YouTube, let's get started with the first stock here, Alphabet. Now this company doesn't need any introduction. It owns the platform that you're watching this video on along with many other products and services. So I'm gonna give this one a strong buy because the two criteria that I'm using are the fundamentals of the company and its relative valuation. So basically the financial health and future potential growth of the business itself and is the stock expensive now compared to where it was uh, in the past and how it compares to its peers in the same industry. If you've seen some of my other recent videos on Google, you'll see why this is one of the best risk reward investments you can make right now. So the next one on the list is Boot Barn Holdings. They're primarily a shoe company and they make cowboy boots and they have a lot of stores in the US and a lot of different brands. But would I be buying this company right now? Well, let's start by taking a look at the fundamentals. I'm using the website roic.ai and uh, this tells you a lot of financial information about the company. So I'm looking at Boot Barn Holdings right now. Uh, we can see that the revenue here is growing fairly nicely pretty much every single year, which is really good to see. If you want to take a look at the growth rate of that, what you can do is copy the numbers from this website. And I have a discounted cash flow calculator here that I can use. So if you put in the ticker, B-O-O-T, it gives you the current market price. And you can compare that to the valuation that this calculator spits out. So if I copy these numbers, uh, revenue, into the spreadsheet here, and then I can calculate the growth rate uh, of each year. So if I take the revenue from one year and I subtract the revenue from the previous year, this gives me the growth year over year. And if I divide this whole thing by the previous year's uh, revenue, it gives me the growth rate. And in this case, I want this all to be in percentages. So that's the growth rate over time. So it's nice that it's growing its revenue every year, but it's not very consistent. And if we take the average of all of these, so I'll go to this little sigma symbol here and say average and just highlight all of these. So that gives us 22% uh, per year. Now revenue came in at one, almost 1 1.5 billion in 2022, which was a lot higher than the previous year. And that's probably because of the stimulus checks, government spending. Um, so that's why there's like a 66% increase there from this year to the previous year. So I'm kind of skeptical that that's going to continue going forward. Now if I remove that, you can see the average of these uh, drops down to 17.5. So as with all DCF models, you have to make some assumptions. So I have a low, medium, and high uh, assumptions here for the different metrics that we can expect this company to do. So revenue growth, I think on the low side, 10% would be pretty fair. Medium, I think 12% is good. And then for high, this is 17.5 for the average of all of these but it's harder to grow a company the bigger it gets. So I think 15 for a high expectation would be pretty fair. And then we have earnings as a percentage of revenue. So this basically tells us how much money from the top line or the sales is kept at the end of the day. So what is the bottom line as compared to the total revenue of the company? Back to ROIC here, we can take a look at earnings per share as a percentage of revenue per share. And if we just use some of these numbers here, like 2018, it was 108 in earnings divided by 25.35 in revenue, and that gives you about 4%. The next year in 2019, we have a uh, about 5%. I don't see a lot of variation. Uh, it seems like it's pretty consistent even in 2021, which gives us about 6% of the revenue was captured for the bottom line. The only light, the only outlier is 2022. Uh, because if we take the earnings divided by the revenue, we can see this is almost 13%. But again, you have to be careful about the one-off exceptions. So for the earnings, I have decided maybe 7% going forward. 
um, of the total revenue makes sense, and then for medium, uh, eight, and then high of nine percent. And then the number of shares changed. So this is taking a look at um, if the number of shares of the company is growing or if it's shrinking. Now, based on Argus research uh, for Boot, we can see that the number of shares, which is this number right here, you can see it's growing every year. Uh, which means they're diluting the shares, not by too much, about 3% or 5% over three years, but it is being diluted somewhat. Um, and it seems like this is the trajectory that they want to go instead of buying back shares. And then finally, we have to input what the PE ratio is assumed to be in order to get a valuation. And according to ROIC, the PE ratio, which is right uh, here, average annual PE ratio, I mean, it's all over the place. The lowest is right now, which is basically 10. So that's good. It tells you that it's very cheap right now compared to its historical average. But you can see the highest went all the way up to 90. So definitely a huge range in there. But if you take out the lowest and the highest and just take the average of these, uh, let me delete that and just paste those numbers in here. So these are the PE ratios over time. And I can average these out and that'll give me 24. So that's pretty high. Uh, but I think that's being optimistic because right now the PE is 10. So for the low expectations, I'm going to go with 12, uh, medium, maybe 15. And then for the high, I think 24 is a bit optimistic, but let's go with 24 and see what we get. And then uh, finally, desired ROI. This, this is the return you want to make if you were to invest in individual companies. And the reason why I put 15 here is because I want it to be higher than the S&P 500. Because otherwise, why would you buy individual stocks just by the index? You don't do any work and you would expect to get whatever the stock market returns over the long term is 8 to 10%. But because I do want to find uh, high quality stocks that outperform the market, I want to give myself a higher benchmark here. So that's why I'm putting in 15%. So here we have the buy targets based on the information that I've uh, put in here. So on the low end, if these expectations were to come true, then the stock would be worth $44 right now, which is lower than the $61 it's currently worth. With medium expectation, that's $122. This is more likely than either of these two on the sides here. And then the high expectation, it would be worth $134 right now, which is basically more than double the uh, current stock price. So fundamentally, this stock does look good. However, on a valuation basis, I'm just a little bit concerned about this. Assuming the growth rate stays the same and we still get a PE of 12, the company will have to increase its margins basically until it has basically 10. So that'll get you to 63, which is pretty much what the price of the stock is worth today. So the market is pricing in a 10% profit margin based on a low expectation of growth. But if I stick with my 7%, then that's definitely going to be a risk because you're looking at 44 minus 61, divided by 61, it's like a 20, almost 28% downside. But most likely the resulting reality is that it'll probably be somewhere in between these numbers. So if we have a, let's say between low and medium, and we take the average of that, which is 44 plus 122 divided by two, so that's 83, you know, 83 on $61, um, you're still looking at a 36% return on investment, which is not bad. So overall, I would put Boot Barn because it has strong fundamentals and because it's continuing to grow. But the only thing that's making this a not as strong buy for me is because of that risk of if they grow slower in the future, then maybe they won't be as a good of a buy as you know some other companies. So I'm gonna put them in a buy, which means if you buy the company now and you're okay to hold it for the long term, you're gonna make good money on this but it's just not going to uh, be a company that's for sure going to knock it out of the park. So I'm going to have a link in the video description where you can go and click on that and it'll basically take you to this same tier maker list and you can then rank these companies yourself. You know, So if that's something you're interested in, then you can compare your results to other people in my YouTube community. So that might be cool to see because this is just my own opinion, but obviously uh, for some of these companies as we'll get to, I'm sure there will be some disagreements to what I think. So the next one on the list here is Western Alliance, W-A-L. Okay, let's take a look at this company. Revenue per share, 
looking pretty good for the most part. It did drop a little bit there and then started to grow again. So the good thing about this company is that it's been around for a long time. So there's a long history of uh, revenue and earnings. And we can see the revenue is growing very nicely. Now, if you use Interactive Brokers, you can go to the Fundamentals Explorer. And if you go over to the uh, right, there's a tab called Value. And uh, instead of doing all the calculations yourself with the revenue and everything, uh, this nice little table here kind of tells you all of that. So this gives you the revenue, which is the same numbers as ROIC, uh, but then it also does the calculation for you of year-over-year -year growth. So this one does look a little more consistent. At least we have double-digit growth for the revenue. And not only that, but on the EPS side, you can see the earnings per share also grow every single year, which is really nice to see. And other than 2020, it's been growing at double digits. And then looking at net profit here, looking pretty good. It's growing ever since uh, 2010 for the last 10 years. It's been growing every year. So fundamentally, there's nothing, I don't see anything wrong with this company. So in Interactive Brokers, I'm going to go to Key Ratios, and this will give me a quick look at what the current um, relative, what the current valuations are compared to uh, other companies and compared to Western Alliance itself, but from previous years. Okay, so right now we're sitting at a P ratio of 8.6, which does look pretty cheap compared to previous years. And uh, the five-year average is 12.8, but right now it is uh, definitely much lower than that. Here are some competitors. And I'll go to the analyst ratings here to see the price targets. So the medium price target is 100 with a low of 80 and a high of 135. So I don't really care about the high because I want to build in some level of margin of safety. So the most bearish analyst thinks this will go to $80 a share in one year, which is higher than what it is today. So that's good. And then the medium is $100. And that could be from higher earnings or it could be from multiple expansion because if the PE ratio, which right now is at again, 8.62, but let's say it goes up to, uh, you know, not even 12, but let's say 10 and the earnings, uh, just assume it's going to stay flat. Then that's going to put the stock up to $89, you know, a 16% uh, increase from today. So that kind of depends on how you feel about the market going forward, particularly the financial industry in the U.S. If you think a recession is coming and people are going to default on their loans and everything, then probably not a good time to be in the financial sector. But otherwise, I think if you have a long-term horizon, uh, this is a pretty good entry point right now to get in. If we look at the P.E. ratio across the years, uh, other than a few bad years in 2008, 9, and 2010, most of it has been pretty good. We have seen in the past, like 2020, where the P.E. ratio has gone in the 8s, similar to right now. But for the most part, I would say uh, the P.E. ratio will hover around uh, basically 12, like we've seen. So overall, uh, pretty good fundamentals. Not a strong growth story though. If you're looking for a stock that's going to like 2x or 3x in the next five years, this isn't going to be one of them. However, if you're looking for stable, steady growth, uh, this is definitely what you're looking for. So because of its relatively low valuation and because it's a strong company and there is still growth potential, just not like 20 or 30%, uh, I'm going to put this in a strong buy, meaning I'm comfortable like recommending this stock. As long as you hold it for five years or more, uh, you should be able to make double digit returns uh, per year on this investment. So I'm gonna put it up there. Uh, the next one here, Tesla. So Tesla seems to be uh, like a stock where you either love it or you hate it. Uh, for me, I'm kind of in the middle. So I'm gonna put this as a buy. Based on the fundamentals, the company is growing quite fast but there is substantial risk to the high expectation of this company. So I wouldn't consider this a strong buy. Um, it's not a hold either because it is a very profitable company and I expect in the next 10 years, they will be able to make the millions of cars um, every year that they've uh, set out to do. If we look at the valuation of Tesla on a free cash flow basis, you can see the price to free cash flow. On average over the last five years, it's 181, which is way too high, but you can see it's come down a lot to 74. Now, you might think, well, 74 is still pretty high because, uh, you know, back in 2018, 2019, 
they were lower. But you know, if 74 you think is high, well then so is 54, right? It's not that much different. But the thing is, the growth of Tesla, I think, justifies the uh, high valuation. Because because if you look at the revenue growth of the company, 68%, 82%, 14 28 70 So you would not expect like a 15 or 20 times price to free cash flow on a company that gives you this kind of revenue growth. Uh, plus the company is profitable. The most recent EPS for the last year um, was positive. We'll have to see over the next couple of years. But all that said, it's hard for me to give this a strong buy, but it's not really a hold either. So that's why I'm putting it in the buy category. And I know a lot of other people would definitely disagree with me, but that's just my take on it for now. Now, next company, NVIDIA. As a consumer, I really like the company. And I like the direction that CEO Jensen is taking the company, going into AI and automobiles and just other sectors uh, outside of the, the traditional hardware uh, chips and graphics cards. So the company is trading uh, fairly cheaply now if we look at the key ratios. Uh, 50 times PE, you know, it's not uh, cheap by normal standards, but, but if we look at historically, um, it's definitely been a lot higher than 50. And if we look at it from a free cash flow perspective, it's the same kind of story. Uh, we're at 45 now, which is lower than at least the previous five years. Why is the valuation so high? Um, and it's similar to the Tesla story. If you look at the earnings and if you look at the revenue growth, these are, uh, other than 2020, you know, these are quite substantial uh, for already a company that is lar as large as uh, NVIDIA. The risk for this company is what if all of the different avenues that they've set out to do, uh, it doesn't all pan out. So if we take a look at the analyst ratings, you can see on the low side here, uh, it's actually 130, which is much lower than the current price today. And the medium price target is only 225, which is not that much uh, higher than the 189 today. It's about 18, 19% uh, upside on that, which is, you know, for a tech company, for a fast growth company, is not the best uh, risk to reward right now. I would say if I have the stock today, which I don't, then I would uh, continue to hold it. I wouldn't be adding more unless this goes down to like 170 or 160. Uh, I think at 150, this would be a good buy. But, but at the moment, I'm gonna give this a, a hold because long-term, this company will still do well. But in the next, uh, even medium term, it's not apparent to me that the valuations can't go lower for this company, especially if interest rates um, continue to move higher or even stay where they are. Next one is Meta Platforms. I used to really like this company and I would put, I used to really like this company and I would have uh, put it into a either strong buy or buy category. However, now I'm thinking maybe it's, it's just a hold because yes, you're probably going to get a uh, 20%, 30% return over the next couple of years. But what about after that? I'm not confident the VR investments and everything around that is going to pay off. So mostly what this company is doing is just, it's an advertising company. But if you're gonna invest in advertising, then I think a better choice would be uh, Alphabet or even Amazon because they uh, advertise on their websites and people can buy stuff right away. So it's really convenient. But let's take a, a look at the valuation of Meta. Uh, I, I believe it's not expensive right now. Okay, so we're looking at a 12 PE. Yeah, I mean, that's basically half of the five-year average. Um, let's see how fast this company is still growing. Okay, so on the revenue side, still growing pretty strong, double digits, uh, as well as the earnings, except for 2019, where it uh, went negative there. But it seems like overall, this company is still growing. And I'm not sure how fast or how much they can continue this over the next five or six years. They are facing a lot of competition from TikTok and uh, other platforms. So to me, it's somewhere between a buy and a hold. So I'll put it in the buy category for now, but I'm kind of concerned that this will turn into um, like an Alibaba or something where Alibaba is still growing, uh, but the growth has been slowing down. It's facing a lot of competition and the stock has just not been very good to investors. Okay, next one, we have Netflix. The biggest concern for me with Netflix is losing subscribers because you can't grow your user base if people are unsubscribing. And it's just a question of how saturated the market is already. Um, with competition from like Amazon Prime and Disney Plus, it's not clear to me if Netflix can still grow double digits into the future. 
So it, it used to be high in the 30s, and then it came down to 20s, and then uh, now over the last year down to 18 for revenue growth. Uh, let's take a look at their relative valuation. And um, it's definitely lower now than it was before. But the thing is, like, how do you know it's not go to 18? But how do you know it's not going to go to like 18 or 17 next year? Right? Because like looking at this trend, it's heading lower. So I would probably wait until the uh, PE ratio has stabilized, so it's not continuing to fall. So other than losing subscribers, I don't think there's anything that's like fundamentally uh, wrong with this company. There's no red flags or anything. It's just this fear of uh, future competition. Um, not that Netflix is a bad company, but the market is just not really liking this uh, stock at the moment. And until sentiment uh, comes back, I think there are better opportunities elsewhere. So I'm going to put this in the category of underperform. Uh, next one here, we have Aritzia. And this one's a Canadian uh, clothing company. They've been doing pretty well. Um, nice uh, growth, nice revenue growth year over year. Uh, very strong EPS growth as well. I would put this in the same category as Boot, where you're probably going to see uh, steady growth moving forward, but it's not going to be anything like substantial. Now, the current price to free cash flow is at 16 times. It was at nine times before in 2020. So although it is uh, currently below average, it would be nice to pick up the stock somewhere around 10 times uh, price to free cash flow. I think that would be a really good value for the company. Uh, right now, buying it, it seems okay, um, but I wouldn't expect to get a lot of value out of this, especially if you uh, look at the uh, current P-E ratio. So right now it's 30, which is quite high. Um, historically, it's been 36. I'm not sure what happened there in 2021. And then we had 15, and then 26, and uh, 24.9. So at 30, I would say we're sort of in the middle, uh, maybe even a little bit high. So other than that anomaly in 2021, I would say just valuation-wise, Aritzia is not a uh, cheap stock to buy right now. And although it is growing, it's not growing you know, as fast as a, like a growth stock would be. And one of my favorite metrics to look at is return on invested capital. And it looks like it's not uh, very consistent. It went from 9 to 15 to minus 17, and then 16, 19, 15, which are all good. But then last year it dropped to 4, and uh, right now it's at 3.6. So unless this return on invested capital goes back to double digits, it's hard for me to recommend a company like Aritzia, uh, especially when the valuations, uh, again, is not relatively cheap right now. So I would probably put this in an underperform and uh, wait until either the valuation gets cheap or management can increase the ROIC back to uh, where it was in previous years. Next one we have uh, Brookfield, which is BAM. Uh, I'm using Yahoo Finance now to look at this company. PE ratio is currently at 20. Let's take a look at how that compares to previous years. Okay, so it looks like uh, something happened in 2020, probably the pandemic, but generally we're looking at 31, 11, 32. Okay, so it's all over the place and right now it's at 19. So it's pretty much in the middle of the pack here. Let's take a look at free cash flow. So it looks like it's below average. So the revenue side, not very consistent. Um, there was a couple of years here in 2014 and 2020 where uh, it went negative. For earnings per share, also not very consistent. We have some negative numbers in there. Um, if we look at the average P-E ratio over time, you can see we've gone as low as in the 8s uh, and then as high as uh, in the mid-20s. So right now it's, in, it's at 20, which tells me that it is uh, definitely not cheap to buy this stock right now. Uh, so I would probably put this in the hold category and I would change my mind and, and slot this into buy if the price was lower, like $40 or something, because uh, right now the valuation uh, doesn't seem to justify it for me. So next one we have Algonquin. And this is traded on both the Canadian and US uh, stock exchanges. So let's take a look at the Refinitiv report. And if I go down to the relative valuations here, okay, price to sales, we're looking at a four, 
but it was at a 3 at one time, uh, just uh, several years ago. Trailing PE, we're at 27, uh, whereas the 5-year average is 21. So that is uh, considered uh, ex quite expensive. And it's already come down from 40 PE. That's really expensive for this stock. I don't know why anybody would pay 40 PE for uh, this company. Uh, because it's not a fast-growing business, as we'll take a look at later. 4 PE of 19, pretty much in line with the 5-year average. Peg ratio of 2.5, which is quite high, um, even though it's within the 5-year average. But a peg ratio, generally speaking, of over 2 is expensive. If it's under 1, it's a great buy. So 2.5, uh, I'm not a fan of that. So let's take a look at um, like how this company is growing. Okay, revenue side it's been growing fairly well, although it looks like the growth has kind of stalled or at least uh, slowed down a lot. Diluted earnings per share, not a lot of consistency, going from uh, like 0.3 and then jumping up to uh, 1.3 and then going back down to 0.4. So maybe instead of looking at earnings, we have to look at cash flow. Uh, but if we look at free cash flow, it's also not very consistent going from negative to positive to negative to positive. Um, so I'm not sure what's happening there, but it doesn't look like a company I would like to buy because there's no evidence that it can keep a free cash flow generating year after year business model. And it's paying out a dividend and the dividend is growing. That's usually a good sign, but if the dividends are growing and your net income is not growing, like it was growing up until 2020 and then it started falling. Yeah, if your net income or your earnings are not growing, but your dividends are growing, sooner or later you're gonna run into problems there. Okay, and then finally we'll take a look at the uh, revenue growth and earnings growth. And uh, it doesn't look very good. In 2019, 2020, the revenue shrunk. And uh, it's grown last year in 2021, but who knows if this will continue because there hasn't been a strong history of um, consistent growth, even in 2015 and 16, there was modest growth, but it was just single digits. Uh, for the earnings, again, all over the place, you have some negatives, and then you have some that are positives. But but it's hard for me to see like where this company will be in five or ten years from now. There's a lot of uh, talk that uh, like renewable energy is going to be the future, and Algonquin is in a really good position for that. But all of that is just predictions and expectations. So I've, if I had Algonquin today, I'd probably sell it. Um, I know there are a lot of Canadian investors who love this company, but if I'm looking at the fundamentals and if I'm looking at the relative valuations, I'm just going to uh, stay away from this one and uh, I'm going to say it's a sell. Sticking with the energy sector, uh, Tourmaline is the next stock that we can look at. Because this is an energy company, it's going to be very volatile and uh, we can see the revenue, you know, grows from like 2000 one year all the way to 5000 in terms of the earnings per share. Um, it's kind of all over the place. 2021. Yeah, it's high, but that's because, you know, all energy companies pretty much took advantage of higher commodity prices. One thing that is uh, interesting with Tourmaline is that there are a lot of uh, insiders buying this company. Uh, it, it, they've been buying the stock ever since it's $30 and just buying it on the way up. So they must really, like the insiders must really believe in this business. Uh, let's take a look at the valuations here. Okay, price to sales, definitely above trend. But again, that's because recently uh, in the last year, we've had really good oil prices. Trailing PE, kind of on the low end. So that's good, uh, meaning it's relatively well priced. 4P of only 6.9. It's definitely near the lows there. And it seems like every time it comes near or close to 5 uh, PE ratio for the forward PE, it kind of hits that support and it uh, goes back up from there. Uh, we don't have a peg ratio here, but most recently below 1. At this point, I would put tourmaline in the buy category. The only reason it's not a strong buy is just because of that commodity risk. Um, inflation comes down, oil prices come down, then this stock will definitely come down as well. So unless you're pretty sure that the price of crude is not going to drop like 20% or 30% next year, um, it's really hard to make any energy company a strong buy just because there's so much risk to the commodity.
Okay, so next one here is Amazon. This one is a buy as well. It's actually one of my largest holdings. I think it's like my top two or top three holdings uh, in my brokerage account. And uh, this is just a cash generating machine. If we look at the revenue here, um, this is in millions. So this would be like 48 billion, 61 billion. You, you can see it's just incredible growth over time. Um, absolutely crazy. Uh, net profits definitely see an increase over the last you know, 10 years or so as well. Um, if we take a look at the growth of this company, uh, we can see the year over year revenue growth, all double digits. There's like no single digits in here and uh, no negative growth for earnings per share. Very nice as well. Um, very high except the last year. But what they sacrifice in EPS, they make up in revenue growth. Okay, next one we have is Constellation Software. This is a Canadian tech company. And it's always had a high valuation. So if we look at the uh, EPS growth, um, it's not very consistent. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. Uh, but the revenue growth is pretty good uh, because they basically just buy other small companies and add it to its portfolio. So it's basically a portfolio of software companies. Uh, if you look at the key ratio, you can see the PE ratio is always high. Like the average is 84.9 and right now we're at 80. So pretty much we're at the average. Definitely not cheap, but this company rarely gets cheap. So uh, at least at this point, I would put this in a hold. You're not likely going to get substantial upside, but because the company always trades at a premium and it is profitable and it has growing revenue, you're pretty safe for the long term and it's very diversified as well. Uh, another company that doesn't need any introduction is Apple. I think this is a very strong company with very good balance sheets and uh, fundamentals all look really solid. The only concerning thing, the only concerning thing is just the valuation. Like the peg ratio is now 2.77. So that's quite a lot higher than what I would like, which is around one or two. So it's hard to go wrong if you buy Apple right now and you hold it for like 10 plus years. But looking at valuations, it does seem a little bit uh, extended. If we take a look at the key ratios and you can see what I mean here, the PE normalized on average in the last five years, it's 23 roughly, but right now it's at 29. So you're basically paying a premium for Apple right now. If Apple was trading at a more reasonable PE, like 20, I would probably say it's a buy, but right now it's hard to recommend this because um, you're basically paying a premium for it. So I'm going to put it in the hold category. And along the same vein, uh, for the next one, Microsoft, I would also give it a hold and uh, pretty much for the same reason. It's a strong company, but it's just really expensive right now. So you're not going to get um, the kind of upside that you would in some other companies. So for example, if we look at uh, Microsoft, this is an Argus report. Microsoft is expected to grow its earnings per share over the next five years at 11% compounded. Keep in mind that number, 11%. Now, Alphabet, on the other hand, this is Google, is expected to grow over the next five years 17%. So I'm going to put these two side by side. So we have Microsoft on the left with 11% uh, expected growth rate. And then we have Google on the other side with 17% growth rate. Now, which one do you think would have a higher multiple? Well, normally the stock with the higher growth rate, you would expect to pay a higher PE ratio. However, if we look at the current PE for uh, Google, it's only 21 times, whereas the PE ratio for Microsoft is almost, is close to 27 times. So this is why I have Alphabet as a strong buy and Microsoft as a hold. Uh, because to me, there's no point buying a company like Microsoft when the expected growth rate is uh, low and you're paying a higher multiple for future growth, right? So it makes more sense to just buy Alphabet. Now, the obvious question is, well, if people think that Alphabet is gonna grow faster than Microsoft and Alphabet has a lower PE ratio, then wouldn't the market just flood in and everybody buys Alphabet and therefore push up the price and push up the PE so that they're more comparable 
And the reason for the disconnect is just because on your uh, assumptions, Microsoft has a lot of recurring revenue. I think like over 80% of their sales automatically renew and they can get more customers. Alphabet primarily makes their uh, income through advertising. So the idea is if there's like a huge recession, uh, either at the end of this year or next year, Microsoft's revenue is going to be quite sticky and they're going to retain a lot of their clients. Whereas for Alphabet, they're more likely to lose uh, clients because customers might be pulling back on their advertising budget. They can't capitalize on consumer spending if consumer spending is down, for example. So that's why the market is willing to pay that extra premium from Microsoft. It's because there are uh, different inherent risks to these different business models. And it just depends on what your assumptions are, what you think is going to happen in the economy in the near future. Okay, next one here we have Okta. And I actually use this in my old company. It's a software, it's a cloud software business that kind of incorporates all your different accounts. So you have one easy login. So overall, I'm not a big fan of companies that don't make money. So Okta is earnings per share. As you can see, it's going more and more negative. And that is a bit of a problem, especially when the revenue is not growing that quickly. So you can see from 2020 to 2022, the revenue grew by, uh, that's about 60 or 70%, which is not bad. You know, that's pretty high growth. But the losses in the earnings per share actually grew by a lot more than uh, double. It looks like that's like triple the amount. So you don't really want to see higher revenue growth at the expense of more negative earnings per share growth because that means your business model is not very efficient. What's good about Okta is that they do have some uh, nice free cash flow per share over the last few years. So hopefully that's going to continue, but um, it's hard to say for a fast growing company like this. Return on invested capital. Uh, it makes sense that it's negative, but it would be nice to see this to start turning positive more, uh, or at least in the low single digit uh, negative ROIC, because that will at least tell you that the stock is uh, maybe on a transition to profitability. So overall, I would probably give Okta a hold. And similarly with the next stock here, Twilio, I'm going to add this into the hold category as well. And it basically makes communication software and applications. So, okay, as you can see, this one, uh, Twilio, also grows really quickly. Uh, you can argue that it's growing at a slightly faster pace than Okta. But again, the problem is their EPS is also growing uh, negatively quite a lot as well. But with fast growing companies like this, um, you're either going to look at, you know, like a year from now, this being like 20 or 30 percent lower, or it could be 50 percent higher. So that's why I'm also putting this into um, the hold category, just because of a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the next one here is also a fast growth company, but I'm going to put this in the buy category, C limited. And that's because even though it's technically not very profitable yet, uh, the revenue growth is uh, substantial as uh, we'll take a look here. They have a gaming platform. They also do e-commerce. It's mainly in Southeast Asia. That's what SEA stands for. And you can look at the revenue uh, growth here. Like ever since 2018, it's just been triple digit growth on the revenue side. And what I like about the earnings is that even though it's negative, you can see the magnitude of the negative EPS. It's pretty stable. So uh, from 2020 to 2021, they increased their revenue by more than twice as much, but the earnings per share only uh, grew negatively by a little bit. So this is a much better situation to be in than this. All right, so if you had two companies, they were exactly the same. One had um, this metric and the other one had this one. This is definitely much better because you're losing the same amount on the bottom line, but you're getting tremendous top line, which um, adds to your future potential of the uh, the business growth. And if we take a look at the um, long term free cash flow per share, you can see in 2020, as well as the following year, it's positive. So, I mean, it's a small positive number based on the amount of revenue they have. For a fast growing company, even if they didn't have any free cash flow, I would be okay with that. 
So that's why I think uh, C Limited is a buy right now because it's less risky than Okta or Twilio. Maybe you don't get the same kind of like 500% upside in 10 years, but it's easy to see how you can um, double or triple the current price. The next one here is interesting. It's INDA, which is an ETF that's uh, a US dollar based index fund for the India stock market. So it has an expense ratio of 0.65, which is not, you know, particularly low for an index fund. And basically what this tries to capture are uh, large and mid-sized publicly traded companies that's trading on the India stock market. So compared to the Nifty 50, this one does give you more diversification. I think this one holds a little bit over 100 um, different securities in there compared to the Nifty 50, which only holds 50 of India's largest uh, companies. So the other ETF you can get is this one, uh, INDY, which is the iShares India 50 uh, ETF, um, which has a higher expense ratio. So I would probably, if I were to pick one of these, I would go with INDA, this one here, uh, which was the suggestion in the stock tier list. Now it's hard to say like if this is a buy or hold or anything because it's an ETF. So besides like looking at each individual uh, company inside this ETF, what I'll do is just look at the overall India market and see how the valuations are. And I'm going to use this table here, which is for the Nifty 50, but it's uh, very similar to INDA. And we can see that um, at least until recently, the P ratio uh, was 24. And compared to the previous years, I think it's pretty much within like average. So I don't think this is expensive right now, but I also don't really think it's cheap just based on the historical chart of the graph. The longest moving average I have here is this uh, purple line right here, which is the 200 uh, weekly moving average. And you can see we're slightly above it. So if anything, I would say it's probably a little bit overvalued right now. Um, of course, a lot of this is going to depend on like macroeconomic conditions and interest rates and all of that stuff. But just as a first look, I would probably put this as a underperform simply because uh, it looks like we're above the long term historical trend of where this is, which I've shown uh, with the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 before is usually when there's a correction, the stock market at least in North America. So I'm actually not sure if this will be the case for other countries as well. But if it's relatively same, then the price should drop back down and uh, test that 200 weekly moving average before bouncing back up or falling through, actually. So, so I'm going to leave um, that as an underperform. Now, of course, if you're living in India, then you don't have to buy this ETF. Uh, you can just buy you know, directly in uh, rupees an index fund with your discount brokerage in India. Next one here is Allied Properties. This one is a REIT. Um, it's a Canadian REIT. That they basically uh, buy and manage office buildings. I used to work for a company that had an office uh, in Yale Town and it was managed by... So let's take a look at the uh, growth over time. So pretty strong, at least single digit growth, I would say, which is what you can expect from a REIT. Uh, this is a very different kind of company than a tech stock or a growth oriented company. EPS not looking so good. Not only is it not consistent, but it's also, you know, we had a couple years of negative uh, growth there. So if we look at, so if we take a look at the operating profits, uh, has been pretty good. It's nice to see that upward trend overall. Let's take a look at the 10 year. So other than that blip, it's looking pretty solid. So fundamentally, this is a good uh, company. This is a well-managed REIT. So it's just a matter of uh, valuations and how cheap it is now compared to previous years. And it looks like we're sitting at about the same level as the five-year average. Now let's take a look at from a free cash flow perspective. So a little bit better here, but when you compare it to other REITs, you can see that other REITs have also come down for their 
uh, price to free cash flow. So I don't think there's any particular reason to buy uh, AP compared to other REITs that are out there. So until I see the um, earnings starting to go higher for this company, I'm just going to uh, say that this is a hold. Um, the next one here, Acon, is a construction company uh, operating in Canada. I used to think that they have a lot of backlog, so they would always be in business and uh, they can continue to turn a profit. Uh, but as you can see, the revenue growth has not been very strong in recent years. The earnings per share um, was negative for last year, but uh, very inconsistent. Uh, from 2013 to 2015, they actually lost money in all three of those years. So I'm going to put Acon in the underperform because you're probably not going to lose too much money because you'll probably get like 5 to 10% annualized growth moving forward. But there's definitely better opportunities out there. Next one is Power Corporation of Canada. This one's kind of in a little bit of everything, uh, mostly in financials, but they also do investment planning, insurance, and financial management. Um, overall, not a bad company in terms of like how much they're growing, in terms of revenue. Uh, not very consistent, but overall like, positive. The earnings per share is kind of all over the map. You have a lot of negatives in here as well as positives. So if I take the but when you look at the earnings per share from 2013 until now, you can see there hasn't been a lot of growth. That's not even like double, um, even though the revenue has more than doubled. So maybe they're facing more competition. Their profit margins are getting squeezed. Those are all kind of potential risks to watch out for in the future. Uh, but in terms of valuations, let's take a look at where they are. So pretty much uh, near the bottom here of valuation. So overall, I'm going to give this one a hold rating. Uh, finally, we have Manulife. This is a Canadian life insurance company. So in the same kind of industry as POW. So let's take a look at uh, Manulife's stock chart. Uh, overall, it seems to be very volatile, like very choppy. This is over the last 22 years. Um, one thing you don't want to see is when a company cuts its dividends. So it looks like it's going up 0 0.13, 0 0.17, uh, stock split, and then 0 0.24, 0 0.26. But then all of a sudden here, it cut its dividend by half from 0.26 to 0.13. And also, just like in the last two decades, you can see from... 2001, uh, it closed at $23, which is pretty much the same as the stock price today, 23.58. So in the last 20 years, the stock price has not done anything. So this is not like the highest quality of dividend growth stocks, because although it does grow its dividends, it's not growing them every single year. There's no evidence to show that next year these will be positive. It could be negative uh, again, just like it's been in the past sometimes. Normally for this kind of unpredictability, you would expect the business to be growing really fast, but I don't think that's going to be the case for uh, Manulife. So you don't really get that benefit of growth, um, even though you have a very volatile stock in terms of you get the volatility in the stock price and also uh, in earnings because, because it's, there's no consistent earnings growth for this company. So I'm going to put this in underperform. It's not really a sell because you do still have that dividend to buttress you in case the stock goes down like a lot. You still have that yield there to cover you. But then again, maybe they'll cut that and the yield will go down. So thanks a lot for watching all the way until the end. Uh, I hope you learned something new about evaluating stocks. Let me know if you think I'm way off on any of these companies because I'm always looking to hear different perspectives. In any case, good luck with your investments. And until next time.